Good afternoon. My name is Tom Beaker, and I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series, held here at the Nebraska History Museum on the third Thursday every month. A detailed schedule of this series, as well as information about Historical Society activities and programs, can be found at our website, www.nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I would like to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding for the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. Rob Bozell is a, is a native of Omaha. He has been a professional archaeologist for over 30 years most of that time for the Nebraska State Historical Society and three years at Augustana College in Sioux Falls. One of Rob's special interests has been the Pawnee, which leads to today's talk. I'd like to welcome Rob Bozell. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate that. Get this started here. Should we do it from the beginning, or we could do it backwards? <laughs> I'd make more sense if we do it backwards. Um, thanks again, Tom. I, um, uh, when I was asked to give a talk on something with archaeology, I thought about when we're out doing archaeology, particularly in the field, that there's two questions I always get. We always get. Uh, and that is, how do you know where to dig? And what, what Indians lived here? What tribe lived here? And the answer to the first question is classified, so I can't talk about that. I can't tell you how we know where to dig. But the, but the, but the, the, que the question about what Indians lived here uh, is never an easy one. Because there's, pe people have this understanding that where, where different people live, that's where they always lived. You know, that, that they'd always been there. Um, when, in fact, they haven't. There's lots of people moving around, lots of migrations, lots of blending of cultures, all kinds of stuff, which makes that very, very complicated to answer that, that question. Um, so I thought it'd be fun to take the Pawnee, which we know a little bit about because they had been here longer than anybody else in Nebraska, and just go through sort of where they came from, uh, what, why they got here, what they did here, and, and sort of their, their history based on, and there's a lot of evidence. There's archaeology, there's oral traditions, there's linguistics. So I kind of want to go through all that stuff as simply as possible and tell you what we do know. Uh, and, and a lot of it is I'll tell you what we don't know because there's a lot of things that we still don't understand. Um, people ask, you know, who cares? Who, who, why do we care about tribal origins? Um, uh, we care for a couple reasons. One, uh, it, if we're going to tell a story of somebody's past, it makes for a much richer understanding uh, knowing where they came from, okay? Uh, the other thing is, one of the things we try to do in archaeology is explain why cultures change, why they stay the same, uh, what are some of the process behind that. And unless you know who people were and where they came from, it's hard to explain change. You know, you can't say... Uh, culture X changed and they became culture Y if you don't even know they're related. So, so it's important to try to, the best you can, figure out who these people are. I mean, I'm not talking about just Native Americans, anybody worldwide. This is archaeologists. That's one of the reasons they want to try to figure out where people came from and what their migrations were and that kind of thing. So that's sort of what I want to talk about. This is a question um, that... Uh, archaeologists and historians and ethno-historians have been asking since the 30s. Uh, and I hate to tell you this, but I may not have more answers than we did in 1930, but, but we'll see. Um, and the Pawnees, first of all, just to give you a little background, are a, uh, from a kind of biological linguistic group called Cadoans or Cadoans that came out of the South, and, they're, and, and there were still Cadoans that, that stayed in the South. Uh, up here, the, the three tribes on the Central Plains that are Caddo and of this group are Pawnees, Arikaras, and Wichitas. Uh, and they 
I think everyone kind of agrees, probably has the, the longest residency in the Plains than anybody else. When you think of Plains Indians like the Lakota and the Omaha and the Ponca, Odo, Iowa, Cheyenne, Missouri, Arapaho, uh, most of those people came around uh, after 1700. The Pawnees and Rickers in Wichita, these Caddoans, seem to have come earlier. It gets murky about how earlier and what happened, but, but that's why they're kind of interesting when you deal with these, these kind of questions. Um, the Pawnees uh, had several bands. Some people call them the Pawnee Confederacy. Uh, two main groups, the Skiri or the Skeety or the, the Loops was kind of from the northern groups. And then what's called collectively the South Bands. Uh, and these people may have had different histories. I mean, they probably did. Certainly different <laughs> migrations, uh, slightly different languages, uh, lots of sort of coming together, coalescing and coming apart. Um, you know, that's the other thing that, that when people think of the word tribe, you have this notion that they have always been a tribe forever, and, it's, and, and that's not true either. There's lots of splitting and coming together. One example uh, that's a good one, I think, is the Omahas and Poncas, who everyone thinks, well, they're two different tribes. They are two different tribes. They have two different governments. They live in different places. Uh, they're two different tribes right now. They actually used to be one. They used to be one people, uh, even as late as the 1700s. For some reason, they split and, and became two tribes. Uh, we're not quite sure why, but the same thing happened with a lot of the Pawnees and a lot of tribes. So it's not necessarily an easy question. The peskiest question about all of this stuff is there's this culture all over Nebraska called the Central Plains Tradition. And it's always been hypothesized that they are ancestral Pawnees and Arikaras. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today. Where they are, they aren't. Um, and, and just to give you a little summary of who those people were, lived in Nebraska, Kansas, for about three or four hundred years, from about a, you know eighty, a thousand to fourteen hundred, uh, all over Nebraska, northern Kansas, western Iowa, and even way out into the front range of the Rockies and Colorado and Wyoming, hundreds and hundreds of sites related to these people. Some are villages, little farms, hamlets, farmsteads. Some are hunting camps. Uh, they grew corn. They they were sort of semi sedentary. They they lived in these little villages. Uh, but also did, you know, we're, had some nomadic bison hunting and hunting. Uh, this is a, uh, these little pink dots are all the known Central Plains Jewish sites that we know of just in Nebraska. There's hundreds. I don't know how many there are, but there's hundreds. Most of, uh, most of the ones along the Missouri and the Lower Platte, the Republican, are, and up here uh, on the Lower Elkhorn are villages. Uh, small villages, usually two or three or four houses, maybe 10, 20, 30, 40 people. Uh, and you get out in the sand hills and out of here, these are largely hunting camps, and they do extend into Wyoming and Colorado. And there's lots of villages, like I said, in western Iowa and northern Kansas. And, uh, so very common, the most common archaeological culture in Nebraska, uh, by far, than any other datable period. Hundreds of sites. This is a typical of one of their homes. This is one up in Sarpy County. Uh, big square permanent or semi-permanent lodges, kind of a precursor to the circular earth lodge. These are all posts, wall posts. These large holes are storage and refuse pits. Um, they uh, made a lot of pottery, pretty fancily decorated pottery, finely made stone tools, uh, real kind of typical early Plains Village culture, some ornamental things. Uh, now, uh, they were very successful in Nebraska and Kansas. Again, they're spread all over. Uh, for some reason, things start going bad for these people in the 1200s, 1300s, and up to the 1400s. Uh, what went bad is unclear, but they, they, they ended up leaving the Central Plains. They, they pretty much abandoned it. Uh, some of the theories about that are there was a new group, which I'll talk about briefly in a second, called the Oneota, which came from the Midwest. There may be warfare uh, with those folks. It's a little unclear. Resource depletion, climate change. There may have been a climate change. Uh, we, don't we don't really know, but we do know that by the 1300s, 
uh, things started to thin out, and a lot of them moved up north. They moved up into South Dakota. Some of them may have moved south, too. We really don't know. Uh, but, but, but by 1350, 1400, uh, there's very, very few of them left in, in Nebraska. Um, and uh, what happened to them is a little unclear, but, but we do know that they, they abandoned the region. Um, the one thing I had mentioned, these Oneota people uh, that did, Oneota is a, a whole different culture and, and it's not the subject of this talk, but there, are, there is these incursions of Oneota people from the Midwest, and by that I mean Iowa, Illinois, Minnesota, Missouri, that's kind of their homeland, and they pushed out onto the plains early on, 1200s, 1300s, and established some big villages. I mean big villages, not these little hamlets. Not nearly as many sites, but, but probably with hundreds of people in them, maybe even thousands of people, we don't know. Um, and they moved into mostly along the Missouri River, although there is one site up in Nance County now uh, by Genoa that's Oneota. Uh, and then they kind of moved back in the 1400s, back to where they came from, and then they reappeared several hundred years later, and they are the ancestors of these, these not Kedoan, but these Siouan tribes, like the Omaha, Ponca, Odo, Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, Osage, all those historic tribes are descended from this Oneoto complex. So uh, just to kind of give you an idea that things are pretty dynamic out here. They made a, the reason we can tell that they're different, they made a very distinctive kind of pottery. Had different kinds of decoration. It's tempered with shell, little tiny crushed up muscle shell. That's all those little white specks. Uh, so we can, sep we can tell the difference between Central Plains and Oneota by the artifacts they had and some other things too. So warfare with these guys may have been a, a factor here. Now, from about 1400 to 1600, Nebraska is nearly abandoned. Uh, it's kind of a generalization, but there isn't much archaeology for 200 years. Uh, the one exception, and we'll talk a little bit about why that may be important, is up on the kind of upper or uh, lower Elkhorn, it's an, actually a typo, or no, actually the upper Elkhorn and the lower Niobrara, there's this group of, this is culture which we call Redbird, named after a little town of Redbird. Uh, uh, that kind of stays up in there. And, and we don't know a whole lot about these people other than they seem to have some similarities with people from South Dakota at the same time. And their sites are not very well dated but seem to be in the 1500s and 1600s. So it's the only thing that kind of fills this gap a little bit. Um, other than that, it's, it's, nobody's living in Nebraska that, for that period of time. And, and true of kind of northern Kansas and western Iowa, kind of all over. The Central Plains are abandoned. Um, now, there's uh, the, the theory that's been around since the 30s or 40s uh, is that what happened was, for whatever reason, that a lot of these people that had been living in Nebraska from 1,000 to 1,300, 1,400, moved up into South Dakota, as I said a little bit earlier. And they're called the coalescent tradition. Um, coalescent, as you know, coalesce means to sort of grow together, to fuse, and, and the reason it's called coalescing is that if these pe when these people moved up into South Dakota, it there was already people up there, uh, and they're the ancestors of what we think are the Mandan and, and Hadatsa, okay, that were already living up there. The coalescent was sometimes friendly and sometimes not friendly. That, so there was, there was blending uh, of ideas, of, of people, of artifact types, um, but there was also, there was also warfare, uh, and, and, and as a result of all this mixing, this cultural mixing, you get new things coming up, like the Circular Earth Lodge seems to have developed up, up there. Large villages, not these little villages anymore, but big villages with hundreds of people, not dozens of people. Fewer of them, but bigger. Uh, blending of artifact types, uh, these big communal bison hunting things started happening, large-scale horticulture and conflict, and the most dramatic one, and this is a terrible aerial photo, but it's all I could find. So you may have heard of the Crow Creek Massacre site. Um, it's an event happened in the early 1300s. It's a site up kind of by Chamberlain, South of Pier, Chamberlain, South Dakota. Big, big village of people that look like Central Plains Church. I mean, their, their, their architecture, their pottery, they look like the people from Nebraska, everything about them. 
if you took if you took the artifacts from the Crow Creek site and one of the earth lodges and you threw it in central Nebraska, nobody would think it's out of place. I mean, it really does. So you know, it, it's probably remnants of some of these people that are moving out of Nebraska. And there was a big massacre there. It, the site was fortified, so clearly they had some enemies. It had big fortifications around it, and uh, they failed, and hundreds and hundreds of these people were massacred. <clears throat> and um, we don't really know who, th who the aggressors were, uh, but what most people think, it was these ancestors of the man and Hanadatsa. So you get a bunch of people moving to a new area, and you got somebody already there, there's going to be conflict. So there's lots of warfare going on back at this time. Um, now, uh, out of all this coalescence, this, 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 this fighting and this blending and, and sharing of culture and all the stuff that happens when you get two major groups of people come together, by the 1600s, 1700s, you can start to see these historic tribes. And up north, by that I mean North Dakota, South Dakota, coming out of that, and particularly North Dakota, is the Mandan and Hidatsa living way up river. Uh, in South Dakota, the Arikara. And then also, and then all of a sudden, kind of out of nowhere, the Pawnee just sort of pop up in central Nebraska again, around 1600. Um, and and uh, based on radiocarbon dating, the earliest site seemed to be around 1600, again, after that 200-year hiatus of nobody being around. Um, and they have uh, these big villages, again, it's not these small little hamlets anymore. They're big villages with hundreds of people, maybe even more, uh, concentrated on the lower reaches of the Loop River Valley, lower Platte Valley, Republican, a few down, a few down, a few down the Republican and blue, although most of them are on the Platte and the Loop. Uh, the architecture, the organization of the villages, uh, a lot of things are very, very similar to these people up north, like the Arikara, Mandan, and Hidatsa. So that's kind of the, the coalescent story of, of what happened. Uh, and the Pawnee lived continuously in Nebraska until they moved to Oklahoma in the 1870s. Um, remember the slide I showed of all the Central Plains sites, all those little pink dots? Well, uh, uh, this is the, the known Pawnee sites. So there's a heck of a lot less of them. Uh, again, they're mostly concentrated in the lower Platte reaches, the and the lower loop, uh, and then a few on the Republican, and a few even down here on the Blue River. There's some down in Kansas, too, a few on the Republican Ville of Kansas, and I'm not sure if there's any on the Blue River in Kansas, but there are certainly some in, in, uh, on the Republican in Kansas. In fact, if anyone hasn't or uh, would like to visit a, a really nice Pawnee museum, there's one in Kansas, and I think it's called the Republic Pawnee Village Museum or something like that. It's, it's just a county south of the Nebraska border. And it's built on a Pawnee Village. Uh, in fact, the, the, the museum itself is built over an excavated lodge, and, the, the, and it's in the middle of the village. You can still see all the lodge depression and stuff. So uh, if you get interested and you're down that way, it's, I would recommend going. Um, Just a few images of the Pawnee in Nebraska. This is an 1860s photograph by Jackson of a probably the what well, is the, the last Pawnee village out by Genoa. Uh, there's a central courtyard probably with something going on there. You can see the earth lodges around it. Uh, this is uh, not a Pawnee village. It's a Mandan village at Fort Clark, but it's, it would look very much the way these Pawnee villages would look like. Uh, on the river, high terraces above, overlooking the, these river valleys. Um, there are lodges, of which there's, there's dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, in each village. <coughs> Upon excavation would look like this. There's the uh, uh, post hole pattern. So it's very different kind of architecture than that early stuff. If you remember, the early stuff was square or rectangular. These are round. So that round earth lodge kind of <laughs> something that's invented up in, up in the Dakotas. Uh, this is also is not in Nebraska. I wish it was. Uh, this is uh, a Hadatsa village near the mouth of the Knife River, Knife River Indian villages up in North Dakota. Uh, a lot of the, the, these Pawnee sites in Nebraska are, are well-preserved archaeologically, but most of them have been cultivated. Now, underneath that cultivation, you've still got very well-preserved lodge floors and all that kind of stuff, but visually, uh, the, the ones in North Dakota were, that had not been cultivated are sort of better. But this, some of these villages in Nebraska would have looked very much like this. This one, as you can see, it's fortified. You can even see the old 
trails coming in and out of the out of the village. Um, uh, the Pawnee, like these other people upriver, were uh, were had a kind of a mixed economy of bison hunting. Would go out probably a couple times a year on bison hunts, summer hunts, winter hunts. Went out into the sand hills, high plains, down into western Kansas. Uh, these are long trips, several month long trips. Uh, and they also grew a lot of corn and, and other crops, beans and squash and, and some other things. And uh, when you excavate these sites, these Pawnee sites and Mandan, Hadassah, and Arikara, all of them, one thing you find is these really deep, really big storage chambers or, or cash pits. And this is a drawing of one that shows corn and corn cobs. Sometimes they'd have meat and all kinds of stuff stored in them. So they were built to to store uh, food, which implies if you've got a lot of people, you're kind of planning for the future. It's not just going out hunting for, you know, food for a day or two. It's, it's, a, it's a more of a, not really a market economy, but it's you're planning for feeding a lot of people over long periods of time. So you've got to store a lot of this stuff. And these things are big. This is one up in South Dakota. You can see this archaeologist standing there. It's over his head. That's the top of the pit. He's excavating in there. So they're, they're big, big storage chambers. So uh, big time horticulture for, for these guys. Um, as I said, also lots of bison hunting. It's kind of a mixed economy. They're hunting smaller animals too and fishing a little bit, but it's mostly bison and uh, corn and beans and squash. This is in Wyoming. All these great pictures are from Wyoming and North Dakota. I need to get, I need to get better Nebraska pictures. Um, uh, the Pawnee, pottery, uh, I don't know much about pottery, but, but those who do, archaeologists who deal with pottery, will tell you that it's, it's, it's a great tool because there uh, are, are very distinctive decorations on it. This happens to be Pawnee pottery and happens to be decorated this way. It's very distinctive. Every tribe, every group, sometimes even families and bands would have their own kind of way of decorating their pot, their own signature. Um, it's mostly just artistic, I would imagine, you know, that this is the way we decorate our pots. And, you, and, and so ceramic ceramicists or ceramic archaeologists use that stuff a lot because they can they look at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pots and pot fragments over vast areas and record all this decoration. They measure them and they do all this stuff. And then they can kind of paint this picture of, you know, different tribes and migrations and that kind of stuff. So the Pawnee had very distinctive pottery. Their, their, you know, their relatives, the Arikara, and, and, and the, their similar people, their Mandan Hadatsa, had very different kind of pottery, just decorated differently. Same size, did the same stuff. They're for cooking and storing, but they're decorated differently. So pottery is a pretty good tool for this. Uh, the Pawnee, uh, like I said, lived here to the 1870s. They were pretty involved in the fur trade, too. Um, and uh, they... Uh, were trading with some of the earlier, you know, French and British, and then later the Americans on the Missouri River. Uh, this is actually Fontenelle's trading post, which is now in Fontenelle Forest. They were probably aware of that. Uh, they were involved, you know, getting trade goods. Trade. They weren't really, they were involved, but not as involved as the Omahas and some of the other people on the Missouri River because they were, you know, the Missouri was like I-80. You know, it was the main through fare where there weren't a whole lot of trading posts set up on the, you know, up on the loop and the, you know, so they would have to come to the Missouri to trade. Uh, but they were certainly involved. And, and, and just like everybody else, uh, when, when the Euro-Americans came, everything changed. You know, their culture changed. Uh, for a while there, it was a, every, it was a win-win situation for everybody. Uh, you know, every, there was, you know, the Europeans and Americans were getting all these robes and stuff, buffalo robes and beaver pelts, and the Pawnees and the other tribes were getting all this fancy trade material, but it, it didn't last long because of disease and a lot of other stuff that we know about, and, and it ended up resulting in the collapse of these people's culture. Um, now, kind of back to our question, uh, you know, it, it is, is what I've been telling you true? Is this Central Plains tradition, uh, were these people in Nebraska a long time ago, they left, and then they kind of came back as the, as the Pawnee. If you just took archaeology data, if you just looked at all these kind of trait lists, you know, the architecture and the pottery decoration and the way they made their arrowheads and the way they did hunting, the answer would be no. They're different in almost every respect. They got 
we go from square houses to round houses, from notched arrowheads to unnotched arrowheads, from different kinds of decoration to some other kind of decoration on their pots, and uh, different kind of burial customs. It's all different. So if you just had archaeology, you didn't know any better, uh, the answer would be, well, these, are, these people are pretty unrelated. They don't look at all the same. But what you've got to remember, and this is where this stuff kind of gets challenging, is that people change. You know, pe cultures change. They start do you know, I mean, we look at our own culture. Look at, the, you know, the way cars have changed in the last 100 years. 100 years isn't very long when you're talking about this kind of stuff. Uh, so just because the archaeological remnants of what people have uh, look different doesn't mean they're necessarily different people. We just don't know. Uh, but it's certainly worth, you know, be, being aware of. Um, okay. Now I want to look at some different kinds of information and, and t tell you what it tells us about this problem. First is linguistics. Um, there's a... Uh, uh, linguistic technique called glottochronology, which I don't really understand. But basically, it's taken different languages and looked for common words in it. And, and I think it's almost mathematical that you can, you know, the, the number of common words or parts of words or whatever, uh, you, can, you can actually look at when language is separated. I, I don't know how well it's accepted. I think there's certainly, like a lot of stuff, there's problems with it. But what the linguists say about these northern Kedoan languages is this, that, uh, remember, the, the northern Kedoan tribes are the Pawnee, Arikara, and Wichita, that looking at those three languages, that nearly 2,000 years ago, the Pawnee and Arikara seem to have split from the Wichita, okay? So, um, uh, that's back farther away than we're even talking about. That's back during sort of woodland times. And then around, you know, 1,000 years ago, 800 to 1,000 A.D., the Pawnee and Arikara split from another language of another group who's kind of become an extinct called the Kitse. And I don't even know if there's any Kitse speakers anymore. But it is ironic that that's about the time of the Central Plains tradition, that, there's this la that these folks, their language seemed to have split off from some other language around the time when we start seeing all these Central Plains sites in Nebraska, Central Plains tradition. The Pawnee and the Rikara are very similar languages. They seem to split about 1400 to 1600. Now remember, that's just about the time when, when, when uh, you know, the, the Central Plains people would have moved up and, start, and, and, and then some would have moved back into Nebraska uh, at 1600, and that very well could be consistent with the Pawnee splitting from the Arikara, that they had lived together as maybe one group, one people up in South Dakota for a couple hundred years. And then they split, and then their languages slowly change. <laughs> and then finally, the bands, the, 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 Nor the Skeety or Skiri and the South Band seem to have split pretty recently in the last, you know, uh, three or 400 years, around 1600s is when they split. So that's what linguistics <coughs> tells us. And it, it, some of it kind of does match this theory that archaeologists have about the Central Plains tradition. Um, Again, there's lots of little problems with it, but it generally sort of matches this story that archaeologists have made up about all this stuff. Now, physical anthropology. Physical anthropologists look at, at human remains in this context. And uh, one of the techniques that they have is this thing called craniometrics. Uh, peop if you look around the room, people look differently. People have different color eyes. They have different skin color. They ha some people are tall. Some people are short. Uh, and that also happens with our skeletons in very, 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 very subtle ways. And this, a lot of this kind of started in Europe, where they started noticing that, that the crania of northern Europeans look very different than Mediterraneans. You know, they, they, and what these people do, they take a bunch of measurements, and they take all these measurements, and they do some statistics, and, and, and then they can kind of group these people. And uh, it, it sort of works. Again, there's lots of problems with it. But, but some of these uh, skeletal remains were measured before. Most of them have now been reburied from repatriation. But before that happened, in the 60s and 70s, there was some research on, on this kind of thing. And I'll show you a graph here in a minute what it sort of showed us. The other thing about physical anthropology that's kind of interesting in this whole context is, 
is when, uh, when the historical society was uh, repatriating uh, hundreds of skeletal remains to the Pawnee and some other tribes, uh, the physical anthropologists that examined those noted that the, these Central Plains tradition people had a lot of trauma, lots of, lots of battle injuries, lot, just lots of, uh, of uh, what looked like the, uh, you know, they had a pretty rough life, a lot, of, a lot of warfare, conflict going on, much more so than the historic Pawnee and some of these other people. We know that they were having conflicts, but so it, it kind of leads, a, gives a little bit of credence to this idea that when the Central Plains tradition abandoned Nebraska, that warfare and conflict was one of the things going on. There's lots of trauma, lots of cut marks, lots of healed fractures, lots of that kind of stuff. Um, okay, now back to this craniometrics business. This is very simplified. Again, they, it's all statistics, and I don't understand it, uh, but, but I tried to kind of simplify it. And the Central Plains tradition populations, again, the, the 1, 80,000 to 1,400 people living in the Central Plains are sort of over here. And the modern or, or historic Mandan and Hadatsa and the Pawnee and Arikara, they're, they're kind of, you can see that it, they're, they're both kind of related. That, that you can, you can kind of see based on this that, that there's some sh possibly some shared ancestry in both coming out of there. Now, other people, like the Lakota, you know, like the, the equestrian nomadic Sioux, are not related at all. They're way over here. And then these much earlier populations, like Woodland, which lived here several thousand years ago, seem to also be kind of unrelated. So one thing that this tells us is that, uh, that, that there, there seems to be some kind of vague biological hereditary relationship between these folks and these later folks, okay? Uh, this is very imprecise. A couple of cautionary things. This was with really small sample sizes. You know, th this wasn't thousands and thousands of crania that were measured. It was dozens, you know. So uh, lots, of, l lots more that could, could be done with this. I think it's very preliminary, and I wouldn't put a whole lot of, whole lot of stock in it. Um, okay. Now, uh, traditions and history. Um, why, you know, that one question, and, and I tried to kind of look at some stuff the last few days when I was frantically trying to prepare this talk about how far back do oral traditions go, and I, boy, I couldn't get a straight answer. You know, I don't know. I don't know. It's a, it's a really good question. Some, some people who are folklorists and oral historians will say, oh, yeah, stuff can go back quite a ways. Others say, you know, no, you know, probably not much more than a century or two. But... Uh, there are, Pawnees do have their own traditions about where they came from. And, and historians ha can look at old maps and, and accounts of early explorers, and there's a little bit of that information. So I want to talk about that a little bit and see what that tells us, uh, both the traditions and ethno-history. Um, and again, most of these are some accounts that Pawnees told early explorers or fur traders or even anthropologists uh, early, you know, in the early 1900s about their understanding of their history. Um, first of all, in terms of Europeans and Americans, you know, when you start looking at maps, uh, it's pretty well agreed that from the late 1600s and up, up until the, you know, late 1800s, uh, everyone kind of agrees that central Nebraska was the Pawnee homeland. So not a whole lot of dispute about any of that stuff. Uh, the most interesting story in terms of this this talk is this uh, thing about Harahay. And that comes from the Coronado Expedition. Uh, there's Coronado right there, probably. Um, he's on a horse, he's the rest of these guys are walking. Um, when Coronado reached central Nebraska, or central Kansas, uh, he, uh, when he was near Lindsborg, Kansas, um, uh, a member of the Coronado Expedition was told by the Wichita's or some a, a Wichita that beyond, presumably north, lived the Harahe. And this is 1541. Uh, and the Harahe is kind of similar to the Wichita name for the Pawnee. So what this guy was kind of saying was, there's more, there's more, there's more people up north. If you go north, there's more, and they're the Harahe. And we don't really know where, how far north, or you know exactly what this guy said. Uh, 
But it kind of suggests that the Pawnee were north of the Wichita's, which were in central Kansas at that time in 1541. Uh, they could have been referring to even farther north, like South Dakota. We don't really know. But it is interesting that somebody said the Pawnees are up, up in Nebraska or South Dakota or somewhere in the 1500s. Now, the Pawnee accounts, um, these are Pawnees telling anthropologists and explorers and stuff about their early history. Uh, there's, a, there's a tale called the Clothes Man Tale, which, which is about... A, a, a individual who kind of helped, concert, there, was, there was a consolidation of a bunch of small villages into larger villages. We don't know when, we don't really know where, or that it was in the Loop River area. Uh, some historians and ethno-historians have said, well, that's clearly reference to the Central Plain tradition being this, these small villages, and uh, don't know. I, I, you know, it could be, but it's, a, it's an 800 to 1,000 year old memory if it is. Uh, the problem with the clothes man tale, it doesn't have anything about going into South Dakota and warfare and all that business. Now, some other fellas, a guy named Bear Chief, a guy named Secret Pipe Chief, and some others, uh, there's different variants of this, but there's this commonality that, that we came from the South. Some say the Southeast, they even refer to where, we, where cane grows, which makes you think sort of Louisiana, you know, South, South, Mississippi area. Others say southwest. I think there's a reference that says something about crossing two mountain ranges and formerly living in stone houses. Well, you listen, you know, you, stone houses, you think of, you know, southwestern stuff. Chaco Canyon, Anasazi, all that. Mexico, maybe. Don't know. Um, they're interesting. They're tantalizing, you know, that, that, this is, that they're talking about the central plains region coming up out of the south a thousand years ago uh, and maybe related to, you know, Mexicans or Anasazians or you know, uh, Mississippian people from the, you know, the deep southeast. And, and Caddo is kind of related to that. There's some relations to it. The question is when. The problem with that is that in some of these accounts are sprinkled with talks about the Spanish. Well, it talks about fighting with the Spanish and horses and stuff, which makes you, well, they're not talking about a thousand years ago if they're talking about the Spanish because the Spanish weren't there a thousand years ago. So it gets murky. But, but there's this consistent sort of, we came out of the South. Now, when they did, who knows? Um, some other stuff, Martha Royce Blaine, an anthropologist, historian, uh, compiled a lot of Pawnee and a Rickera myths, uh, and talks about the Pawnees living in grass houses on the Nemaha. We don't know what that's about. I don't know what that's about. We don't, there are Central Plains Christian sites on the Nemaha. There's no Pawnee sites that I know of. Uh, don't know what that's about, but it's consistent. Also talks about, uh, all pa Pawnee traditions living somewhere along the Niobrara, um, and, and which is interesting because Pawnees, um, you remember one of the things in this, this model that we were talking about was that th there is this redbird thing, uh, this w which is dates in the 1500s and 1600s on the lower Niobrara and the Elkhorn. Uh, which is the exception to Nebraska being abandoned. And so there is some reference to the Pawnees living on the Niobrara. There's certainly no modern Pawnee, there's certainly no 1800s or 1700s Pawnee villages on the Niobrara. So it could be that. I mean, you know, we know a lot about Niobrara archaeology, and there's no Pawnees. There might be some hunting camps and stuff, but there's no villages up there, except for this Redbird stuff, which could be what we're talking about. Okay, the other thing that's just interesting is that the Pawnees are a little unique. Um, they have uh, some things that a lot of other Plains Indian, Plains Indian didn't have. Uh, this star charts, uh, this cosmology, they had priests, uh, they had human sacrifice at one time, um, all of which is not real common with a lot of the other tribes. And it does have that kind of southern feel to it. You know, it, it, th there are things that are vaguely reminiscent about the Pawnees and this kind of stuff, like star charts. Uh, which, you know, are vaguely similar to Mississippian people in the southeast or Mexicans, you know, northern Mexico and, you know, Aztec and that, that kind of stuff. So c clearly at some point they came out of the south, whether it's a thousand years ago or 400 years ago, that's kind of the, the, the problem. We don't really know. Now, to kind of summarize all this stuff, uh, 
and, and see why, back to what I originally said when somebody asked, what tribe lived here? Uh, you know, it's not that easy. Usually by this time they've already walked away and said, well, we don't really, we don't really care what tribe lived here. Um, show, show us some arrowheads. Um, but it, uh, it, it's, it's really interesting, you know, and, and, and it's what's, what I think is, is a lot of fun is taking archaeological data and, and trying to connect it with this other stuff, particularly the oral stuff. You know, sometimes it fits pretty well. Sometimes it doesn't fit at all, you know. Um, and, and uh, you know, if we kind of look at what we do know, you know, this sort of general model of the Central Plains tradition going up into South Dakota and there's all this sort of warfare and this blending and, and, and from that comes to the north, the Mandana Dotsa and South Dakota, the Arikara, and then their relatives, the Pawnee, moved back into Nebraska. I still continue to think, even though there's problems with it, is the most kind of logical e explanation. Now, there's uh, lots and lots of sort of unconnected dots with all that, but but it it makes some it makes some sense. Uh, it makes a little bit of sense with the linguistic data too. It, it you can you can kind of connect it. Um, Biology, we don't really know enough. We really don't know enough. I, you know, I don't place a whole lot of credence in that. I think the future of this question, a lot of questions like this, may be with DNA. I don't know what, I, I know 20 years ago, there, there was really not much of a, uh, there was nobody that was able to extract DNA out, out of old, dry bone. I, I think there's been some advances. I mean, if after we talk, if somebody wants to share, I'd be happy to hear. I don't know. I, I think there's some technology that are moving forward in terms of being able to extract DNA from from bone, uh, which could would be really interesting. Um, the ethno history, you know, it's it's just it's just kind of hard to tell. I, you know, there, there seems to be this consistent something about people coming out of the South. I I I, I not knowing really. And I'd be happy to hear from folklorists and ethno-historians and oral traditional people after I get done blathering here what their thoughts on this are. I, I, I get the general sense of doing a little bit of research on oral tradition that it doesn't, it's not real reliable after a couple hundred years. Uh, so, you know, these stories about coming out of the Southwest, are, are they a thousand-year-old stories? I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm a little skeptical of that. I, I think... You know, the Pawnees were very connected to the Southwest it, during the 1700s and 1800s and even probably late 1600s. You know, that's where they're getting the horses, lots of trading and raiding and lots of going back and forth between, you know, New Mexico. They talk about fighting with the Kiowa and Comanche and Apaches and all that stuff. I think a lot of that, that that's what those memories are. But, but I really don't know, and I'd be happy to hear what others have to say about that. Um, uh, so... You know, that's kind of, we really, we really don't, don't know a whole lot. But some of these kind of remaining kind of pesky questions are what I just, you know, went over. Uh, we don't know much more than we did 80 years ago. I, I think that general model, the archaeological model, seems to kind of work the best. It makes some sense. Um, you know, for one thing, the, you know, that, that's, the, you kind of got to think about all this is, Everyone agrees the Pawnees and Arikaras are closely related, biologically, linguistically, culturally. No one really disputes that. And everyone seems to be pretty comfortable with the Pawnees, or the Arikaras, excuse me, developing in South Dakota in the, from 1300s on up to the historic period. Well, if that's true, and the Pawnees are closely related, then you kind of got to have the Pawnees up there too. And, and where they kind of came from would have been from Nebraska. It kind of leads lends some credence, I think, to that that whole theory. Um, um, and it's supported, you know, a little uh, by linguistics and lesser degree craniometrics. Um, Hera hates puzzling, you know. I, I you know, I'd, what's kind of interesting is 1541 is pretty early. We, based on what we know about archaeology in central Nebraska, seems too early for Pawnee stuff. I think they're still up north, farther north. Uh, I mean, there's no, the earliest radiocarbon dates are 1600, 1650. They're, you know, this is a century earlier. Um, what Martha Royce Blaine's referring to with these villages, grass huts on the Nemo, I have no idea. I don't know what she's talking about. But, but it's, but it's she, you know, it wasn't just one person. Several of them talked about that. Uh, same thing with the Nye River villages. So the, um, I guess in conclusion, I would like to hear anybody's ideas or questions, is that, uh, 
you know, we still got a lot of work ahead of us, and we don't know a lot more. Um, and uh, but it's it's I kind of wanted to really you know tell you why that question is not easy to answer. And it and it's the same thing with any tribe. If you ask me about you know where the Odo come from, where the Lakota come from, right? that's a good one. The Lakota is a good one because people will you know when you think of Plains Indians, who do you think of? You think of the Sioux. You know they're bison hunters, equestrian warriors you know, dominated multiple states. They must have been here forever. No, they came, they came from, they were rice farmers in Minnesota who came out here after 1700. They were peaceful little farmers, you know, and, and then they came out here and completely changed their culture, completely changed. You would, if you just looked at their culture, their material culture and what they did, and then you, and then you, you know, the, 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 these big bison hunters and warriors and dominated, you know, tens of thousands of square miles. And you said, well, they're, you know, 100 years before that, they, they were living in, you know, along the Great Lakes growing rice. Said, no way, you know. Yeah, it's the same people. They, they adapt. They, they radically changed. So it's a not, not an easy question to answer. And um, I'll conclude with a picture of Machu Picchu, which has nothing to do with the Pawnees, as far as I know. <laughs> But it's a great picture. So that's about all I have. Does anybody have any questions or any, certainly any comments about oral tradition and any of the stuff I've talked about that I don't know much about? I'd be more than happy to, to, to she had her hand up first. Um, I recently had a trip to India. And the culture over there in each tribe, is, they have 37 states, and it's all around a tribe. And they have the only common language is, is the English, the King's English. But my question is, <coughs> you, you showed us how they stored the food, and did and the Indians in India did the same thing, but they evolved into this hot fire that we eat today because they didn't have any refrigeration, and they figured if they added heat to the to their food, the more heat they added, the, they got less sicker. So that's that's the evolution of the in Indian cuisine, but I don't see that that the um, that our Indian people did, did they didn't turn to heat, did they? I mean, why could they say their food better than over there? Well, the the storage chambers here are the, the theory is that it's I mean they might have they, they might have. Uh, dried some of the food, like dried some of the buffalo meat and, 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 and harvest some of the corn. And then it was a cool, underground is cooler, you know, so it would, it would preserve, now that's not going to preserve, yeah, it, it, it's, it would preserve it for longer. Now they had chronic problems with these pits because you dig a hole in the ground, you put a bunch of food in it, you're going to have two problems. You're going to have rodents digging into it and you're going to have water coming into it. And so they're constantly having to build these new storage chambers and the old ones they use as trash cans, basically. They fill them up with trash. They do. Yeah. No, really, they do. And, and they're just, they're, they're very, very useful for archaeologists. But I think just getting them, you know, out of the sun, uh, underground where it's a little cooler, uh, is, uh, is, is why they were able to, you know, store, store the food. Those storage chambers was a real source of conflict, too. Uh, I didn't really talk about conflicts with the... Uh, the, the Cheyenne and the Lakota and, and those folks, but there's lots of raiding going on, and that's lots of them. They'd come to these Pawnee villages and Rikara, Mandan, and Atza and, and, and raid these storage chambers for food and stuff. So. One more comment. Yeah. I did see a rock house. I mean, they were living inside. They had, it was about 14 foot round rock, had a beautiful front door on it, but they hollowed it out and they're living in it. In India? Uh -huh. Wow, cool. I think these, these, References to these stone houses, they're talking about, you know, uh, you know, t taking, building stone walls out of stone blocks and stuff, like Chaco Canyon and Anasazi and, you know, that southwestern stuff. There, there is a site in western Kansas called Cortalejo, I think, and it's by Fort Scott. It's an actual Pueblo in Kansas uh, where they have stone houses. It's Wichita, probably from the 1600s, 1700s. So, you know, again, the, the, you know, the, the, some Pawnee saying, well, we used to live in stone houses. Well, it could be some memory of El Cordalejo and visiting there, staying there with, the, with their relatives, the Wichita's. But uh, you had a question, sir? Yeah, actually two, but I'll, I'll put one. Uh, the question about 
the uh, honey human sacrifice. Yeah. You know, some of the, the books that I've read have suggested that that would make some kind of connection with the people that you know they asked about the same area of origin that the Aztecs might have come out of. Uh -huh. Are there any other groups on the plains that practiced human sacrifice in that fashion, or is that unique? Not to my knowledge, but if anybody knows, oh, I'm sorry, he wanted me to repeat the question. His question, was there any other Plains Indians other than the Pawnee which practiced human sacrifice? And my intelligent answer is I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, I've always heard that, that they're kind of unique in that respect as a, as a ceremony. Uh, and, and that ceremony was uh, stopped in the 1830s by a guy named Petalasharo or Petalasharo. He was a... 1817. Okay. Last one. Okay. Is, is, is that, are they the only ones that had as human sacrifice? As far as I know, yeah. Yeah. Um, they, they did try a few times after that, but they weren't successful, and the, the tribe was against itself, and, and so the, the, the times that they tried the human sacrifices after that, the tribe tore things apart and could not get that sacrifice yeah. together. That's one of those things that just has that kind of southern feel to it, maybe even Mexican feel to it, yeah. Okay, then the other question, you don't have to deal with this, you don't have to. So whenever you pick up... Uh, the think about archaeology, you can just make this stuff up. up. The, the, the book about the plains Indians and stuff, they never mention how do they dispose of the human waste. You know, do you lose the village? And if, you, if you have settled villages like that, how do they deal with that? I don't know. <laughs> Go to the edge of the village, I think. <laughs> you know, I mean, these, uh, these villages, remember, they, they had, you know, as I said, a lot of these pits that they were used to store would be filled with trash, and that is trash. They also, a lot of them were fortified. And the, when you, when you, we've done some excavations on these fortification ditches, and they're filled with trash, too. And I assume, now, human waste is not going to preserve, but, it, but it's going to turn to organic soil. And they're very organic, rich environments, these things. And... Probably that too, yeah, yeah. Redbird is a pottery, I think, is it not? I wonder if that's where some of this, the name Red oh, came from. Oh, that's Red Wing. Oh, Red Wing. Red Wing, okay. yeah, yeah. We got five more minutes. Go ahead. You had an interesting plot there on the cranial metrics yeah. of different tribes right. that scattered around. Right. What are, what are your orbit and abscissa on that? I knew you're, I knew there'd be a mathematician here. I, 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 that's why I said I don't know what what the uh, I don't know that, that I, I tried to make that thing simply. I took it from a bunch. They take a bunch of statistics. And I think they do factor analysis or something where they've got it clusters or cluster analysis. What they those those people do? They take a battery of measurements, fifteen you know length width all probably dozens of measurements, and they, and they do some kind of statistics to it, and then it clusters, other clusters, cluster analysis. <laughs> I just made all that up. Go ahead. I don't have a question, but I would like to sec second your recommendation uh, for people to visit the Pawnee Indian Museum. Oh, yeah, it's great. It's great. In Republic, Kansas. Yeah. Um, I don't know if the same curator is God, do you remember his name? There's a, it's a man. I, yeah. I can't yeah. I think he is still there. Uh, Same guy. My oh, I'm sorry. Uh, she had just said, uh, oh, I'm sorry. no, I, I got to repeat the part. Um, to uh, recommending that, that you go to that Republican uh, Pawnee Village in Kansas. And my husband and I spent a whole afternoon there. That's great. There was hardly anybody there, and he, he just talked to us about, I mean, it's, it's just a wonderful museum. And that is. Yeah. That, that was, that was uh, given to the Kansas State Historical Society, and they actually um, used um, a CAT scan. Yeah, so x rayed it. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. they would tell what was inside the That's an interesting story. She mentioned that that Pawnee site, they have a sacred bundle. And then we got a couple minutes, and I'll just tell you about that. Only certain people yeah. could open it. Bundles are very, very sacred in, 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 in Native culture. And, and only certain people could have these bundles and know about the contents of them. And they did have this bundle. And I think kind of during NAGPRA, when they were talking about repatriating sacred items, this issue came up. 
And the Kansas State Historical Society worked with the Pawnees, and the Pawnees said, well, we don't really want it because we can't, we don't really have a place for it. We can't safeguard it. The people who should have it are no longer around or whatever, but they, and I don't know how the negotiations evolved, but basically, uh, we, we don't want you to open it, but we are also, we're also we all kind of curious about what's in it. So they cat scan and x-ray, and there were some uh, bird skulls and some feathers and some other stuff, which they were able to identify through the x-rays, and it is on display down there. With the... He's going like this. this. Guy's going like this. I think that means to wrap it up. So I'm I'm done. I'm done. He says I'm done.